All right, well, welcome everyone. This presentation today is going to be for two main types of people. The service desk managers who are trying to keep the chaos from crashing in and the service desk analysts who are just trying to keep their heads above water. So any service desk managers out there will know that the chaos of the ITSM world all too well. From businesses that keep asking us to do more with less through to how to retain good staff uh, and make the best out of the not so good staff. And as for services analysts, the seemingly endless day-to-day -day firefighting and common boring tasks that we do over and over and over and never seem to get anywhere. My first job, um, I was the only analyst and I had three phone lines plus a walk-in counter to monitor and assist with. There was nothing quite like the thrill of having one person already on hold, asking the person on the second line to please hold while you look something up just so you can answer the other line and ask them if they can hold just to answer some other question from a student who just walked in and said that their coffee, their cup holder had broken on their computer when they tried to use it or that their keyboard kept typing the letter L and only after they'd sort of washed the keyboard in with the rest of the dishes. Yeah, I kid you not. We've all got those horror stories, right, that um, of, of students or end users that are doing all sorts of crazy things with their machines. And that's what we have to deal with on a day to day basis. And I remember trying desperately as a manager not to lose someone off the service desk because they were really good at their job. But they kept complaining about the monotonous new user creation or this day in, day out monotonous items that they had to deal with and they wanted to do more with their career. All IT service jobs I've had over my career have the same sort of experience, the same sort of chaos and the similar sort of themes through, uh, running through them all. So today we're going to take a look at some of the common causes of this chaos and why it's worse than ever at the moment and then how to put in some really solid plans that you can put in place to get started, to get ahead of this chaos once and for all. First off, a bit of housekeeping. For all these sessions will be recorded uh, and will be released online for you to review and share with others in your organization following the event. We'll be holding all questions until the end of this presentation where we'll be hosting a 30 minute lounge session that you can join and discuss any in-depth questions that you might have. And we'll also have an open floor lounge available for you throughout the day to drop in and ask questions uh, you might like, no matter how specific and also get a chance to listen to questions from other people and what they're asking that just might spark some ideas and some thoughts about your own environment and scenario. Okay, so by ways of introduction, my name is Brett Moffat and I'm a solutions architect with Sorison. And if you haven't guessed already by the accent, I'm based in Australia. I take care of the Asia Pacific region and really enjoying it and I really enjoy getting the best solutions for customers, and I love to hear the stories of how much time and energy that they've saved by implementing what I'm going to share with you today. If you want to get in touch with me at any stage in the future, please feel free to reach out via the usual methods, email, Twitter, LinkedIn, and the like. I'm always up for a good conversation around these sorts of topics. Um, and as I said uh, in the previous thing, I really encourage you, I'll, I'll be joining the uh, lounge after this session, so I really encourage you to come and join that uh, lounge session afterwards. Let's have a discussion. Um, bring your very specific questions uh, about your environment. There's not many environment uh, types that we haven't touched here at Cyrusen. Um So we're always up for a good challenge. But uh, yeah, so bring along any questions that you have afterwards to the lounge. All right. So our day-to-day -day chaos on a service desk is filled with all sorts of questions like, I can't get into a site. Can you upgrade my permissions? My laptop isn't working. Can you order me a new one? Is my account locked out? Do you have time this afternoon to come and have a look at my issue? How much time off do I have left? You know, HR type questions. Uh, I have to write an email about a system outage. Can you help me out with that? How can I change my email signature? I need my manager's approval. Uh, how can I board someone to this project today? A lot of these questions are one-off and we need expert knowledge from our analysts 
uh, and the sorts of accesses to the system to answer these kinds of questions. But usually there are some questions that repeat more often than others, such as I need, a, I need access to the SAP system or I have a new starter that starts in five minutes. You know, I need an application installed on my machine uh, and I need it now because I've got a board meeting in three hours from now. Can you please give me VPN access? I've just started working from home and I can't log into the to the environment or just plainly I can't log on. And of course, the always classic, can you change my password? Well, these questions come in thick and fast from a wide variety of sources. Phone is the obvious and traditional one, but as millennials start to join the corporate workforce, we start to see less and less requirement for phone calls and more on other more direct means of communication, such as email, teams, walk-ins, automated alerts, suppliers, and even social media. Email has its own challenges, like the sheer volume of emails that come in, and that can just be overwhelming, especially if each has to be manually handled and entered into the ticketing system. Mix that with the number of analysts that are actually doing the triage work, uh, who has one opened, who's responded to it, has it been logged, it just adds that other level of confusion. More so in the last few years, collaboration tools such as Skype for Business, Yammer, Slack, and MS Teams have all become a major communication tool within organizations, and we have to manage that also. Then there are, of course, all those the people that walk into our desk or stop us at the water cooler just to pick our brains about an issue. Many systems also start to automatically generate those tickets, and automated systems such as SCOM alerting is alerting us with uh, incidents from time to time. Suppliers like Microsoft will be in touch when they announce new patches or updates. And in some organizations, even social media is making that impact. All of these, all of this chaos results in one major impact on the service desk and the business in general. And simply put, that is time. The impact of all this chaos in the amount of time that we as a company spend reporting, waiting, fixing, rebooting, logging, forwarding, reading, etc. When we think about how long it takes to do a seemingly simple task, just like, say, reset a user's password, we don't really look at the real time it takes to do such a task. So, for example, if a user calls the service desk and we spend a few moments uh, introducing ourselves, diagnosing what the particular issue is, maybe it's something other than their password, then finally resetting their password, spelling it out to them over the phone, waiting for them to type it in and then explaining the password policy before they finally change their password um, and finally letting them get back to their day. We then finish up logging that call before moving on to the next call. Now, I know this might only t seem like it takes sort of three or four minutes if we're lucky, but what's the real time impact here? The customer has already been offline long enough to realize that they can't log on or can't remember their password. So that's already consumed maybe 10 to 15 minutes easily of their time. Then the three or four minutes that we spend with them is actually six to eight minutes of company time because it was us and the end user that were involved in the call. So in a perfect world of password reset, it has, a co it has cost the company easily 20 minutes in the real world dealing with customers who are not technical this can easily expand to 30 or 40 minutes each for each password reset and that's just for password reset many other calls that we have that would take much longer than this this was the status quo up until last year when we got even special type of chaos the 2020 special chaos in 2020, of course, it introduced even more chaos to service desks worldwide. While the core challenges didn't really change, they became more complicated and more in volume. Those core volumes spiked. Rapid deploy, deploy projects came out of the blue as we had to roll out massive amounts of hardware for new laptops. Internet connections, consumables, security tokens, setting up customers working from home. And we had to deal with all this while we ourselves were trying to deal with moving the service desk staff to a work from home model. And just for fun, 
like we didn't need any more, the cybersecurity threats nearly doubled in the first half of 2020 alone. And these numbers are not looking like they're going to abate through 2021. I'm sure by now the service desk analysts listening to this presentation are having flashbacks and starting to rock back and forth in the corner because this kind of work is not what they signed on for. As analysts, we sign on because we love problem solving and we enjoy working with IT systems. There's not many people out there that sign on to service desk duties just because they really love resetting passwords and creating user accounts all day. All of this additional special chaos results in one major impact to the service desk and the business in general, more time. The time taken on every call has now increased. Not just password resets, but home router setups and VPN accounts and security dongles and authenticator apps and the inability just to pop down to the user's desk and take a look like we once could. So now that we've stated the problem, and I now hear you asking, Many of you will be waiting for me to start talking about automation and scripting solutions. Let me set some expectations here first. When I say automation, many people start to either worry or for the technically minded, they just want to jump in with reckless abandon. I know I'm one of those. When I'm talking about automation in this context, I'm not talking about coming up with scripted automation from whole cloth. I'm simply talking about moving that needle forward, however slight, removing one boring or repeating request or issue off the service desk radar. It just moves that needle forward and starts to rein in that chaos. Any of your repeat requests deserve to be templated with clear processes defined in them. And make no mistake, I'm fully aware that you're saying, well, templates are easy. They aren't that big of a win or they can't possibly save me that much time. Well, what about time for something really simple like time spent communicating on a ticket, sending email communications to users to update the details of a ticket? Simple enough. The process is the analyst updates the ticket and then writes and sends an email to the customer. Seems quick, seems simple for one ticket. Most of you here on this call have probably implemented the Cyrus and Notify Analyst tool and automated this process, which is great. But how much time did that actually save you? Well, if you consider that sending a single update to a ticket would take, uh, let's say, seven minutes to draft up, we add comments to it and send it out, and a reasonable time, I'd suggest, about seven minutes. If we even have a modest number of tickets raised per month, let's say 50, we'd save nearly six hours of analyst time. And that, that's crazy. If we have heavier workloads, the number gets even crazier. If the team fields 250 calls a month, the automated email notification process is nearly saving you a week's worth of full-time employment. And as I said, I'm sure analysts don't join the service desk because they love sending emails. All that time is time that analysts are not spending on doing the more interesting stuff. And that is allowing them to get more of that fun stuff and interesting stuff into their hands. These additional pieces of mundane and readily repeatable work just add to the chaos that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Removing or reducing the time and effort taken to complete these tasks reduces our overall burden of day-to-day -day chaos. And that's a big step towards taming the chaos all over. Okay, so that's a really basic example, and it's just numbers I've sort of pulled out of the air. So here's a real example that I have from a customer of mine. I had a customer here in Australia, and when we asked them their least favorite task to do on the service desk, it was unanimous. User onboarding, creating a new user account. When I asked them to step me through that process, we worked through what that process would look like for them on a daily basis. Now. Ideally, of course, it was always nice to be able to uh, have HR contact them and let them know that, hey, there's a new person starting three days from now. More likely, the person was actually walked into the service desk and, hi, this is Sally. She starts today. Um, we need a new user account for her. 
So it was that um, wasn't proactively done. It was all reactionary. So we worked on it and I had to fill in a form. Yes, it was a paper based form, mind you. It went over two pages. The first page was all the usual stuff. First name, last name, phone number, email address, manager, job title, nothing groundbreaking. And then the second page was just line after line of check boxes in the system that they used or you could potentially use as a user, say SAP, their HR system, their occupational health and safety system, their CRM, their EPA records, and the list was vast, about 60 of them on the page. Now, not very many users would have all of them, but um, they would have a selection of them. I've jumped forward there in my slide. Am I? Yes, I have. Oh, I revealed the numbers. Oh, well. Um, and next to each one of those systems was a checkbox and an area to sign a signature from the person who owned that system. The analyst then created the AD account by typing that, um, typing out what was already on the on the page. And then the analyst would then walk that piece of paper from desk to desk for each of the approvers uh, of those systems and get the user to sign off um, on each of the system that the user had requested. To then walk that form back to the service desk, scan the approval form in so they had a, a record of it, and then add the user rights to those groups. And when we actually walked through this process um, from writing it up, the creating that a usable account took us about 45 minutes, 45 minutes per account. And that was just the analyst time. Double that for the business because during that 45 minutes, the user couldn't actually log on and therefore couldn't work. With just 10 new user requests per month, that's an entire day spent chasing new user forms per month. And when we looked backwards um, at previous records, in the previous month, they had 56 new employees. That's an entire week spent getting signatures on a piece of paper and creating the user in 80 users and computers. So by simply asking the question of what was their least favorite task, we were able to focus onto something that we had a, a well-defined process for, and we could provide a realistic solution that could give them the service desk uh, that extra week in a month, and the business nearly two weeks in a month in work time. This was automated via a service request that we created, um, and it, it could flow through that system much, much faster. The actual time for the uh, service desk to actually work on it turned to zero. The time that the end user had to do without their account depended on uh, the, the amount of time it actually took to approve it. But we saw that drop to about 10 minutes. So much, much faster. Okay, so where do we actually start? Where do we know where to um, focus our needs um, when it comes to calming down this chaos. If you've ever tried to tackle your internal ITSM process before, then th this scenario that we're going to go through is a great starting place um, if you haven't attempted it. If you have attempted it um, and you've seen that it's never really started to work or it died a natural death, then hopefully we'll be able to uh, step you through here what uh, are some of the common pitfalls and how to avoid those as we go through. And hopefully this, these tools will get the ball rolling and get those quick wins to build confidence in tackling the next one. So we start this whole process simply by asking the right questions. So what sort of questions? Well, what about the following? What do analysts hate doing or find the most frustrating? Nice and simple one. Your analysts have a wealth of knowledge behind them. Um, use that. What are the common issues that stop a customer in their tracks and prevent them from doing their work? Uh, at the end of the day, we're an IT department that enables our end users to do work. So what are the things that would get in the way of our customers doing their work? And then what are the simple little things that cost a little bit of time and aren't that very aren't, aren't that complex 
But we do so many times in a day that all those little chunks of time all add up, add up and we end up dying from a thousand paper cuts of, of just doing this thing over and over and over again. Or the opposite to that, what are the things that only pop up from time to time but take a huge amount of time to deal with or are absolutely mission critical and we cannot get wrong? Often when we start asking these questions, we don't not only get a better idea of the sources of our chaos, but we often uncover risks that we've never considered, such as the one person in the team that always handles uh, SAP uh, systems um, or adding user accounts to, to SQL. Well, what if that person's not available when we need them? Or even worse, what happens if that person is no longer available at all? They've left the organization or something's happened. So what are the most common answers we hear and what are some simple solutions? Let's also not forget that it's easy to access data that we can derive from our own ITSM tool. With some basic reporting and investigation, we can look at stats of what types of incidents and requests we do repeat every single month or week or day. This source of data can give you real world examples of what phone calls you'll always get. Maybe access requests, new hardware requests, uh, mailbox issues, software problems. Email requests are even easier as we have the full transcript of what the user is actually requesting. We can look back over these and work out what type of email always makes it to the inbox. And then we can focus on how do we eliminate those. Also, what email hits our inbox and keeps getting deferred to later because no one wants to deal with it. They're the key ones to be able to focus down on too. Okay, so how do we tame this chaos? Now, <clears throat> The answer is going to be a lot simpler than you first think. And I know when I give you the answer, I'm going to hear a few groans across the audience or eye rolls um, in saying it, but it is true. And the answer is as simple as process. Process is key to taming the chaos that we experience every day. And we don't have to go far to find a, a story of where a process is broken down in a catastrophic way. This year alone, there's been a cyber attack on a water treatment plant in um, Oldsmar, Tampa Bay, Florida. Some of you may have read it uh, in the news cycle. And in the news cycle, we hear of this cyber attack and the media love to run with, you know, this great story of sophisticated hackers with their pages of code scrolling across the screen, doing all crazy sort of Mr. Robot style attacks and to really sell that story. However, the reality of the situation is that it was just a simple example of where the IT service process broke down. Nowhere near as exciting, I know, and it's hard to sell that kind of story to Hollywood to make the next big blockbuster, but at the end of the day, it was just a user with too much access. They were let go, and the organization didn't disable their account. The offboarding process either did not exist, was not followed, or it failed miserably. So this disgruntled user with their extra access to the system uh, that they shouldn't have had in the first place, they briefly manipulated the amount of sodium hydroxide or lye that was supposed to be used in the city's water treatment by a factor of more than 100. Though the attack was quickly recognised and, and the solution was put in place, the action alone could make it the most successful cyber attack on critical infrastructure in the US to date one process, one process breakdown. Could have been solved by one automated task, one self-checking process, one checkbox. None of that would have happened. So I know that process isn't the sexiest of answers and it's not going to attract the likes of Ryan Gosling to a feature film, but it is core to starting to turn the tide of service desk chaos. So the number of calls that are received by a service desk can be a massive source of chaos for organizations. With such huge volumes of calls um, being received via phone and email, or even paper phones, the paper forms, the limited resources of the service desk can quite quickly become exhausted 
And the ability to respond to any other priority one request can be greatly reduced. This leads to poor performance for the entire organization, poor tracking of call details, uh, as analysts don't have time to record the correct details. And of course, we get to burnout of analyst staff. A simple solution here. Um, a simple solution for these sorts of call volumes is self-service. Now, I know when I say simple solution, you may think that self-service solution is a long way from where your organization is right now. However, I can tell you that a self-service portal is a lot easier than you think to generate. Historically, the trickiest part was getting end users to engage with the portal and use those self-service features. But cell phones and the prevalence of apps um, for every possible interaction from shopping to health has slowly been chipping away at people's reluctance to use self-service type apps. And then 2020 has changed the end user consumption model even further with wanting to interact with and request uh, from support organizations at any time of the day or night from anywhere on the planet. Self-service solutions can also assist by reducing the number of follow-up calls from customers who just are looking for a status of their update of their ticket. In one customer example here in Australia um, that I worked with, we saw a 60% drop in calls once we offered a way for end users to be able to see the status of their ticket. What would you do with your time on the service desk if you could reduce your call volume by 60%? But wait, I hear you saying, what would this mean for staffing levels? Well, there's always projects and other ideas that never get actioned for an organization's continual improvement approach to ITSM. Any reduction in call volumes can easily allow for reassignment of staff to more value add type projects. In the particular case of the, the customer that I was talking to, it, it, uh, talking about earlier with their 60% reduction, they could move a couple of those analysts to full time looking at their service catalog, their, their self-service, and how to further automate that process. And they drove those uh, self-service tickets uh, in a lot more, which actually drove the numbers down even further. Analysts could then get time off in a week to be able to go and work with the networking team or uh, the storage team or the infrastructure team and they actually uh, enhance their learning that way. So it was a great way to be able to feed um, analysts into the organization, train them up with inside of the organization, keep their interest going while they worked on the service desk throughout time. And then when a job did come up in, in networking or infrastructure or storage, they could move into those sorts of roles. So their turnover of staff reduced greatly as well. So yeah, it is, don't just look at um, self-service as this full automated type kiosk. Um, there's a lot of quick wins that can be created from service, um, from a self-service type environment. Also around call escalation. So when a call comes in and, 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 and um, it needs to be escalated to another team because it can't be solved at first contact. Many organizations have issues with the high percentage of those calls having to be escalated to higher level or higher tier supports due to either uh, security not having the, the analysts not having access or the tools or, or the access to the training that they need to be able to get that job done. Therefore, we're using um, higher paid um, analysts in the second or third level to spend time on these repeating these mundane basic admin tasks um, as they're the only ones that, that know the system or have the access that's required. And this slows down the response times and greatly offends the customer's satisfaction to the service desk team. With those systems, it really turns the service desk into just a call center. Miscommunication between the service desk and that higher level support can also throw things off as well. So if it's not communicated correctly, the, the second level or third level um, environment the, uh, support team uh, get the wrong information, they can take the wrong steps in that process. So 
The solution to high call escalations is actually threefold. First one is access to the right tools, automation of the request processes, and education. Having access to uh, a, a unified tool set that can be controlled using a role-based authentication and also that logs any or all of the tool set um, ensures that everyone can get access to the tools that they need, where they need them, when they need them, all without compromising security. If configured correctly, these tools would enable an analyst to achieve known repeatable mundane tasks without giving them additional or overreaching rights to systems that they should not have access to or don't need access to. When a tool set cannot be found to fit the needs of an organization, um, or the tool takes additional time and effort, the second solution can step in and pick up where it left off. Automation of known request processes can reduce or even eliminate analyst involvement with a call altogether, and not only maintain security of systems, but also allow access to any system um, other than re reduce access to any system other than to just a single service account. But an automated process can also ensure that the process is followed each and every time without fail. Many organizations looking to achieve ISO certifications or to comply with industry standards or governmental policies um, on auditing struggle to prove that the process is followed all the time and they're unable to audit each and every transaction. Automation of a request offering achieves this with little effort and some continuous improvement. So these sorts of tool sets and automation also reduce the call length, further reducing the chaos for both the service desk and the end users. It's because the tools are easily at hand and can be triggered and followed at that initial contact and resolve that call um, when that call is actually made. Finally, education is key. When all else fails, the automation is not an option, tool sets won't work, um, and the escalations are out of control. It's important to educate analysts with the correct processes and procedures, as well, um, and the required audit tracking to ensure that the systems re remain secure and processes are followed. This education uh, needs to be ongoing and uh, reminder courses and surprise audits also need to be used to uh, ensure processes being followed where we can't uh, use the right tools or automate it. That's important to remember. Um, a great example of, of, of where this sort of falls down um, and use of tools is absolutely important is resetting passwords. It's, it's kind of service desk 101. When a new analyst joins the team, this is a new person that's come into the organization. Um, they sit on the service desk. One of the first security rights we give them is the, the ability to reset users' passwords. Now, question, does your organization give that new person that you've just hired, that potentially has just come in from university or, or you know, straight out of high school, do you give them access to reset service accounts or admin accounts on day one? What about the CEO's account? Well, this is a ma massive possible security breach and with little or no way of auditing it. Having a select set of tools that limits the accounts that a user can reset or for different levels of analysts can reset different levels of, of user accounts um, to ensure that they only have trusted and proven team members can reset the right level of, of, of user accounts. Using a single tool set also allows for any auditing to prove that an analyst changed whose password when. The next step is to automate the request as, as, as far as reset passwords are concerned. So that password, that uh, process is completely um, audited and, and tracked. An example here would be, say, if a user calls up and requesting an account password to be reset, an analyst can enter all the um, the details and start the automation process into a template. The automation can then test the key process steps, such as if the user account is an admin of the system, if so, does that system owner need to be approved for that password reset? 
is the account running a, a, a critical system or could changing the password on that stop the service from being logged on and, and therefore stop that system? Um, these sorts of processes, uh, process decisions can really enhance security purely by following a known set of security rules without the possibility of human failure or missteps while recording all this data for future audit if need be. So it's not just about telling the analysts to be able to do this work directly, but rather have those tools that they can type directly into. Maybe it's a service request, maybe it's a self-service type request offering that they could type that information into themselves um, rather than the end user um, having to self-service it. But definitely that process being followed every single time and made sure that it is done right every single time can absolutely save um, not only from a security perspective, but also just from the pure number of calls and calls that need to be escalated. Okay. So what are some common processes or process-driven tasks that we have in, in, in organisations? We have in our organisations. Uh, user onboarding is a really good example. Um, creating a new user account and setting them up with access right in the software if they need to do their job. Um, even if your uh, organisation doesn't have a self-service portal, some form of digital forms for customers to raise their requests with the key information directly, um, there's no reason that the process could not be moved onto the ITSM interface for analysts to inject those um, details directly into a form themselves. Yes, it does add that additional step, but again, we make sure that we, we get hold of that process. So templates, I know it doesn't seem like um, take up a lot of, um, have much of an impact or could potentially have much of an impact on uh, the chaos that we have on our service desk. But if even if we have our own internal uh, templates that we can enter that information into um, and to follow that process, to then automate that process in the background. And of course, that automation can, of course, be um, whether it's Orchestrator or Azure Webhooks or PowerShell. PowerShell, I'm a huge PowerShell fan. So, you know, the ability to do those common tasks, onboarding, offboarding, uh, user rights management, general notifications that are that are sent out over time uh, when a system's down. So uh, when people contact the service desk, they, they get that information. All of these things can be automated and, and put into templates to really make that um, take control over some of that chaos. So when we start to look at this process, when we start to look at, uh, say, our onboarding process or our offboarding process, where do we start? Where, where do we, what do we have to actually look at? Um, and if you've ever uh, tried to do this in the past, uh, and and failed or, or, or the, the project never really got off the ground. This is where um, things mostly break down for people that I've found. So I always draw this triangle um, and go through it with people. Now, if you're a techie nerd like me, I love to script, I love to, to get into a product. I would jump straight in at the product level and just start creating code. And that can work. However, you'll find yourself repeating a lot of stuff and, and having to go back and iterate uh, more and more and more. Rather, start at the top and look at policies. And when we talk about policies, we want to ask the question, what compliance policies do we have to comply with? So when I say that, we're talking about things like um, HIPAA or Sarbanes-Oxley or um, any of those governmental policies, maybe it's Department of Defence um, that you're dealing with or, or a legal organisation, or you're wanting to comply with ISO certification. What are the sorts of uh, chunks of information when, we, when we're creating a new user or offboarding a user? What are the key pieces of information we have to keep? How long do we have to keep them? Um, what level of authority uh, has to be approved on, on those particular things? What process um, is built into that policy that we have to show to comply with that policy? We need to know those rules right from day one. 
If there's a key piece of information that we have to have as part of it, and whether that's their uh, tax file number or um, what is it in the US, social security number, uh, some piece of information like that that we forget and we don't put it into our process and then we miss it and we have to go back and iterate that. So knowing what that policies, what the key pieces of that policy are, from there we can then build out that process. So we know we've got a bit of a template there of the key pieces that we need to bring into that process. Then where does that process start? How does it start? Um, what does that process look like? And is it documented? Okay, so knowing where that process can kick off from and also looking at out of the box ways of where that process can come from. So in the example that I had before of the, the 45 minutes for that, the new user um, ticket coming in, one of the big wins there was the fact that um, somewhere in the vicinity of 90% of the user accounts were created on day one when the user walked in and the user themselves had to fill in the form, tick all the boxes. It wasn't done proactively. But before that user started, there was a whole interview process. They, they advertised that role. It went out to market. They interviewed people. They found someone. They made them an offer. They um, accepted that offer. They filled in all their paperwork and they got to their bank details and where they were going to pay them, where they were going to send the information. So they gathered all of that information weeks or even months before that user actually started. All of that information was plugged into the HR system. Well, including their start date because they needed to tell payroll when to start to pay this person. So what we did is grab a, a hook to read that key information. What new users have been added to the HR system? When do they start? Who's their boss? Okay, we can see that there's a new one there. Create a new service request that, hey, there's someone new in the organization. Their manager is blah. Hey, manager, here's a request of all the systems that they're needed. Which system do they need to get access to? Um, you could even take it down to the, or you're part of this department. Uh, their job title is this. So the average is usually this. So we're going to tick those for you. Uh, does this look right? Do you need extras? They could tick that. That service request then goes through and approves, um, goes to all the, the right approval type le uh, levels. They can all approve those review activities. They would all get, then get reviewed. The account would be created and then put on hold until the user starts. As soon as that user starts, um, the, the, the account is created, bang, and they're done. So that, that account creation for that end user was reduced to seconds uh, once they actually started and walked into the organization. So think outside the box when it comes to where that information comes from to build that process out, okay? Where do we pull that information from? What's our single source uh, of truth uh, and what can trigger that? Then move on to product. Then look at what the product can do to support that process. How do we get those uh, uh, web hooks or um, SQL queries to be able to query certain databases? That's where the technical rubber hits the road, okay? But without building out that, that policy and process first, we could just be sitting there spinning wheels for, for, for months and years. So look at your small wins first. User onboarding process we've talked um, a lot about um, because it's something really common that we all have to deal with and um, can often go terribly wrong. Same with user offboarding. You know, as we said with the, the, the water treatment facility, that process completely failed or didn't exist. Who knows? Um, but a really, really good one. We know that, uh, you know, again, the HR system, the payroll uh, group knows when to stop paying this person because they're no longer working for the organization. That information should be able to flow downhill to us to be able to make sure that we turn their account off, that we disable their, their uh, access to their VPN or um, SCADA systems or any other system with inside our environment. What do we do with their data? Do we move their data, uh, their H drive, and make it available to their manager so they can filter it out? Do we back that up and move it to a different location? Do we move their account to a different OU? Um, what does that process look like? Um, group access, um, getting access to uh, a different AD group, such as uh, a distribution list. You know, distribution lists 
um, nine times out of ten, you know, people can just get added to them, so they don't need approval. We can just show them a list; they can select it and 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 jump straight into that um, as they need to. It, there might be ones that we do want to get approval for, so those particular uh, distribution lists have someone that that has to approve that before they can get added to it. Um, create an application catalog that they can select what applications they want installed onto their machine. So if someone all of a sudden needs Visio at, at the last minute just before a board meeting, they can select that. And if the licenses licenses are available or their manager approves it, they can get hold of it. Um, creating a, a hardware catalog that, that they can order from, uh, a shopping cart type experience, if you will. But the most important thing is to make a start. Find something and actually make a start on making that, building that process out based on your policies and then finding ways to, to reduce the amount of time, the amount of uh, contact time with that. And initially, it might just be a template. It might just be a template that you're able to uh, put in and capture that key information. Um, it might be reading that information from another system and creating an incident laid out with exactly the right type of information. And then from there, iterate. So once we've got that information, then maybe look at automation. How do we then script this? How do we uh, trigger the next event, the next template that goes along with this, the review activity that goes with it? Um, iterate through those, that continual improvement that people, um, many organisations seem to miss when it comes to the ITIL um, best practices. Continual improvement seems to be the one that gets missed more often than not. So the takeaways from this uh, presentation here today is really start the conversation. You know, get your analysts together, find out what are those key tasks, what are those things that that really upset people, and and you could get some quick wins on. Um, build out that process. Look at the policies. Know what you have to capture build out that process, document that process, whiteboard it out if you need to, create a big flow chart or just list out those checkbox type steps. Look at a self-service uh, type solution. Again, with so many people working from home, working late at night, or early in the morning, all sorts of crazy times um, because they're not in the office, a self-service portal is probably exactly what they're looking for right now rather than uh, having 24 seven phone access to the service desk. Look at the admin tool set, the, the Cyrus and uh, remote support tool set um, absolutely fits the bill uh, when it comes to that type of admin tool set by reducing the friction between um, the ticket coming in and actually diagnosing the problem and fixing the problem all within one screen with inside service manager. You know, really, really good tool set there and fully audited and controlled by uh, role-based authentication then look at automation, then look at your your, your orchestrators, your PowerShell, um, PowerShell activities, uh, even Azure and Azure webhooks, you know, and the community. Community.sirison.com have a really good uh, uh, list of different uh, automation pieces that other people have done. Um, they're happy to share their code and, and, and um, different scripts that they've put up and, and how they've actually done it. Once we do that, once we get into a space that um, we're actually actively getting ahead of this chaos, we can actually turn uh, our IT there from a from a business cost to a business enabler. So we're actually enabling the business to sell more widgets or teach more students or you know get on with what it is that your business actually does as a business. So. That's it for this presentation. Um, for any questions, jump over to the virtual lounge um, at the end of this presentation. Uh, I'll be available there to, to discuss any questions that you have here, uh, talk about more examples, um, and hopefully maybe even put you in, in, in touch with um, other people, um, other customers that have had similar sort of experiences um, that you're looking to solve yourself. Um, it happens more often than you'd you'd think, um, and that's a really positive thing. So, yeah, I look forward to seeing you over in the virtual lounge. Thanks for your time.